Right now we're joined by Chris Mannix from Sports Illustrated, somebody I have lectured with at the University of Southern California. And uh, Professor Mannix joins us right now. Are you in Milwaukee? Are you in the Deer District? I'm not in Milwaukee. I was uh, on USA basketball duty the last week in Las Vegas, so uh, spent my time watching the finals on TV. Chris Mannix, a season pro, the Las Vegas assignment or the Milwaukee assignment chooses Vegas. Yep. Uh, we appreciate you taking some time. <laughs> uh, the NBA Finals roll on tonight, though, Game 6. And besides Chris Paul's interaction with Scott Foster, maybe switching it up in the pregame, maybe a little nod and a wink as opposed to a scowl and a glare. But what else can Phoenix do to switch things up to try to get this series back to a Game 7? Well, you know, their, their defensive struggles have been – maybe the most perplexing over the last three games. This team came in to these finals playing the second best defense in the playoffs right behind Milwaukee. And if you look at the numbers, you know, half court transition, whatever, they've just collapsed over these last few games. Some of that I think can be attributed to DeAndre Ayton just being stretched way too long in these games. I mean, an underrated aspect are, are variable in these finals is the Dario Saric injury. And that, that injury limited Monty Williams to really eight guys because he doesn't trust Frank Kaminsky. And, so, and you see Aiden out there, I think it was 39 minutes in game three, 45 in game five. He's having to play a lot of minutes. And I think they have to find a way in this game, even if it's, even if it, it, it's potentially hurt, uh, hurtful in the short term, of getting him out of there and, and playing somebody, be it Kaminsky or somebody else, to just make sure Aiton is fresh for that fourth quarter. So yeah, that to me is, you know, Chris Paul is the obvious guy to watch. You know, does he play better against this Drew Holiday defense? But for me, Aiton and that Suns defense is, is the biggest question. Chris, the biggest question we had in the studio was uh, how did the guy who was counting money make his money in the stands? Uh, did he, how did he get the money in his pocket that night? How much money did he have? Uh, one of the great moments of the NBA Finals was that, that the, the money shot. Uh, talk to me a little bit about some of the other great moments in the Finals and where they are historically in terms of, you know, Giannis's block and just sort of the coronation of Giannis and this performance. I, I mean, I think the block, if the Bucks finish off this series tonight or Game 7, will, will live in infamy. I mean, we remember the LeBron block in large part because they won that series, right? Like, if they had lost, we probably wouldn't remember it as as strongly. Uh, if the Bucks close this out, that block is going to be replayed over and over again in the pantheon of those great finals moments. Because just like LeBron, there's probably not two or three players in basketball that can do that to both have the ability to step out on a on a screener or on the roll, and then get back and block a shot of a seven-footer at the rim. So that, that, to me, is just a signature moment. Giannis has had a couple, of course, um, some big scoring nights early, that dunk at the end of Game 5. But, you know, that, that block, I say a couple of guys could do it. Maybe there's nobody that could do it. I mean, Giannis is just so genetically gifted and so skilled defensively that he might be the only player ever, you know, to pull, be able to pull that off. Chris Mannix joins the show, the Crossover Podcast, and, of course, Sports Illustrated. Ben Lyons in for Rich on the Rich Eisen Show. Let's play this out, Chris. Phoenix loses tonight. Milwaukee wins. How does that impact Chris Paul's future and where he might play next season? Well, people around Chris Paul have, have told me that like, they'd like to get something done with Phoenix. Now, you know, this is probably Chris's last contract. It's kind of amazing we're even saying that since two years ago we were talking about the contract being an albatross on the, around the neck of whatever team – uh, gets him, but he's in line for a three-year, hundred million-ish contract in his next deal. They'll take him right around thirty-nine years old. Uh, and, and look, there's, you know, Chris didn't just get traded to Phoenix. Like he wanted to be there. Like he scouted that situation. He knew Monty Williams. He he believed in Devin Booker. So uh, I think there's a and look. He's, he he still lives in L.A., so it's a short hop for him to get there. So I think there's momentum to get a deal done for around three years one way or the other, whether it's opting in and extending, opting out and a new deal, one way or the other, I think there's some momentum there. The wild card, though, is Robert Sarver. I mean, you know, that, that roster is going to get expensive. Does Robert Sarver have it in him to just say, look, we got to give this guy a blank check. Whatever he wants, we've got to give him, because if we don't, everything we've gained over the last calendar year 
gets wiped away. I mean, Cameron Payne's been incredible, but you don't want to go into next season with Cameron Payne as your starting point guard. You need Chris Paul to continue to build on what they've accomplished this season. So if I was a betting man, I'd say it gets done one way or the other. But Sarver, who doesn't have a tremendous track record, uh, he is a variable. Chris, you were just uh, covering Team USA as they get ready for the the Olympics. And we're going to see three of the guys playing tonight as part of Team USA in a few weeks now. Devin Booker, uh, Chris Middleton, Drew Holiday as early as next week. Uh, How do you think they blend in to what's happening right now with Team USA, which has been a roster in flux? And walk me through their schedules. When do we see them playing for Team USA if they're in the NBA Finals for another few days? Well, I talked to Greg Popovich about this on Sunday, and the expectation is that they will arrive in Tokyo uh, about a day before the first game. So I'm guessing Sunday is when they're likely to arrive uh, there. Uh, you know, nobody really knows what to expect from these guys. And I asked Pop that directly. I said, you know, I mean, you've been on teams or coach teams that have been to the finals. They've experienced a grueling postseason. You know what's left in these guys after it's done. I mean, what are you expecting from Booker, Middleton, and Holiday? And he's like, I just don't know, man. Like, I don't, I don't know what these guys are going to be able to give. I mean, you know, maybe they come in with some energy, especially guys from the team that won. But I think more likely than not, they're just gassed out. And they're, you know, they're going to play and, and contribute, but you're not going to get the, the finals version of Devin Booker and Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday. So, you know, USA Basketball is counting on them because their roster right now is paper thin. I mean, Zach Levine is not going to be there right away. We'll see how that works out. Jason Tatum's been battling a knee injury. Uh, they need those guys to, to play for them and play well, but I just I don't know what you're going to get from them after uh, this type of final. That's why I think this U.S. team might be in a lot of trouble when they get to Tokyo. Chris Mannix joins the show, Sports Illustrated, and the Crossover Podcast. Ben Lyons in for Rich. This is the Rich Eisen Show. And it felt like on Friday, Chris, that the Damian Lillard story was like an end-of-the-week end news dump. Uh, let's uh, put that out on a Friday at the end of the weekend. There's NBA Finals going on. People won't really pay attention to that as much as maybe they should. Does going to Tokyo and, and leaving the country and having the games actually start, do you think that brings some of the attention away from the Damian Lillard stuff, or does that add to it because he'll be on TV every night? Well, no, I, I think it'll take away, and I think it gives – everyone a chance to go to their neutral corners and figure out what to do next. Now, I don't know what came of the meeting in Vegas between Damian Lillard, Chauncey Billups, and Neil O'Shea. I would imagine that Neil O'Shea and Chauncey, you know, directly asked Dame if he was in. And, you know, Dame said this on the call with reporters. What he says to media is basically the same thing he says to, to the front office. Like, he's not He's not giving two different answers here. So what? So his feelings about that team are, you know, are, are what we heard. So I would expect in the next month you're going to see Portland try to do some things. I don't know what they can do. They've got one great asset in C.J. McCollum, but everything else, it's, it's not as valuable as maybe they think. So I think you'll see them try to improve the roster in the next month. And then come mid-August, when USA Basketball is over, we'll see where they are in Portland. If they made the kind of upgrades that Lillard needed to see in order for him to fully commit to coming back to Portland. You know, Chris, there's something interesting about this USA team, and and I don't I, I obviously uh, I, I know it's an unusual Olympic cycle. Uh, obviously, with the, the the way the NBA season was scheduled and rolled out, certain guys were limited and weren't able to participate, but. The idea that they should be the favorite just because they're America seems rather ignorant to me. I mean, you look at basketball on a global scale. You've got Giannis tonight, a two-time MVP. Jokic, the MVP this year. Luka is an emerging star in Dallas. The game's gone global. So why do you think the Americans should even feel like they should should be the favorite just for showing up? Well, they, they shouldn't, and hopefully they don't, because this U.S. team is – not the A team by any stretch. And even if it was, you know, these these games are just different. I mean, we already saw Nigeria, which has a handful of minor NBA players, win against the U.S. We saw Australia, which 
has NBA players, but if you put that team in the NBA, they'd struggle to get double-digit wins. You know, plus the FIBA rules are so different. I asked Ricky Rubio that. Like, what are you noticing when, you know, guys come to international games for the first time, like many of these U.S. players are, and it's like they struggle with physicality. They struggle with some of the rule changes, like the, you know, five seconds in the lane and uh, the goaltending rules and some of the other things you're allowed to do. It's just an adjustment. So, like, you know, the the U.S. team is always going to have the biggest names no matter what group they send. But this version of it, you know, if I had to make a prediction, I don't, I wouldn't predict them the medal. I just wouldn't because, you know, there, there just are some really good international teams going. You know, Spain, who you, the U.S. played on Sunday and beat, they're going to be good. I mean, the Gasol, like these teams have got players that have been part of their program for decades now, and they're familiar with each other. I mean, Ricky Rubio. Like, FIBA Ricky Rubio is like a different person. Like, he is, I, I, he's not the NBA player, you know, that fans in one of his many stops have grown to see. He's just a really, really good international player, and so are many of these guys. So I just think this U.S. team, with the team it's bringing over, and the fact that I don't believe that those three guys that are coming late are going to be miracle workers, I think they're going to have their work cut out for them just the medal. Chris Mannix joins the show, Sports Illustrated, the crossover podcast. Ben Lyons in for Rich. This is the Rich Eisen Show. Do you get a sense, though, from being around Team USA that despite not, you know, you don't sound like you have confidence in them to meddle. However, do you get a sense from being around the guys that they understand the magnitude of the moment, that they understand just what a privilege it is to be representing Team USA and considering everything happening in the world, the fact that we even have an Olympic Games and just sort of understanding where their place in history and, and, and alongside some of the all-time greats. No, I, I think they do. And, you know, all these guys want to be here. And I give them a ton of credit for, you know, jumping into the program with the understanding that COVID was going to be an issue during training camp and COVID will be a big-time issue when they get over to Tokyo. Their movements are going to be incredibly restricted, making the bubble look you know, almost free, free by example, you know, almost like it's, it's a, 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 anything goes by example. Um, the, the, I don't think they're, they're overconfident at all. I, I think they understand what their, their duties are and, and they want to do it. It's just chemistry matters. And it, it's just impossible to get the kind of chemistry that you need to beat teams that have been playing together for a generation. I mean, I'm, I'm watching like, you know, Louis Skoll, I think is still out there. And yeah, I mean, the Gasol brothers, Rudy Fernandez, like that, that Spanish team, all those guys were in their mid to late 30s at this point. Powell hasn't played NBA basketball in two years, but he's out there playing for Spain. I mean, it's, it's really, it's just so difficult to match the chemistry. And in these international competitions, chemistry is as important as talent. So overcome, you know, if the U.S. team gains chemistry on the fly in ways I don't expect, they might win, they might win big. But if they don't, they could lose, and they could lose pretty early. Chemistry also a thing with the NBA Finals, Chris. You know, it's it's interesting to me that in an age of player mobility, you've got Giannis and Chris Middleton as the longest tenured Bucks on this team, and the fact that Brook Lopez has been there for a while now, and there's some cohesion uh, with this group. Uh, do you think that's a trend we'll see with with team building moving forward? The idea of really wanting to commit to your guys for an extended period of time, developing your program. Uh, you're seeing it with Devin Booker now. Uh, pretty soon the conversation's going to turn to around, you know, his free agency or his future. How do you see the, the impact of these finals permeating throughout the league in the next few years? Well, I mean, teams, especially small or smaller market teams, want to keep their group together. I mean, that's their best chance to win, knowing that they can't lure stars in free agency the way some of these bigger market teams. So you have seen and will continue to see you know, teams like Phoenix and Milwaukee do everything they can to retain the players they have in their pipeline. I don't, I don't want to overplay chemistry, though, because I think we'd all probably agree if the, if the Brooklyn Nets were fully healthy, they'd probably win that series. I mean, that, that's a Nets team that was thrown together on the fly with like 10 games together in the regular season and a handful more in the playoffs. So talent still matters in the NBA. And if you have superior talent, you're probably going to win a lot of these series. But for smaller market teams... You know, you look up at Milwaukee as an example. They've kept Middleton and, and Giannis together. They signed Holiday to a four-year deal, so he's part of the program uh, long-term. You know, their, their goal is to win through these guys, and they've done a good job of doing it so far. 
Chris Mannix joins the show, Sports Illustrated. Of course, the cro- crossover podcast, Ben Lines in for Rich, the Rich Eisen Show. Other stories uh, around the world of NBA basketball right now is the status of Kawhi Leonard. And, and Chris, if, I, if I'm Kawhi, um, I've got to be thinking about you know my future long term and looking for a long term deal somewhere, signing a one or two year deal right now, or opting out, or you know I I don't know if I can have the confidence in, in my health long term. Um, can another team have that confidence in Kawhi giving him a long term deal? And do you think he stays in Los Angeles? I do, and I think Kawhi, you know. Kawhi's got an ACL injury that's probably going to keep him out most, if not all, of next season. And even if that's the case, I do not foresee the Clippers blinking at giving him a max level extension at some point. I mean, Kawhi's in a sort of a similar situation contractually as Chris Paul, where look, he can opt into that big number, $45, $48 million, whatever it is, next year, and then extend it, or he can opt out and sign a five-year deal. One way or the other, I think he's going to do it with the Clippers. I'm I would almost bet the house on it. I mean, he's the, he just has the Clippers over the barrel. I mean, the Clippers gave up everything to create this roster. If Kawhi walks to somewhere else, I mean, they they don't have any avenue to to build a winner for like the next five or six years because of all the draft picks and young players they've given away. So, yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't count on much if anything from Kawhi next season, but I do expect uh, you to see him sign some kind of long term deal with the Clippers before the start of this one. Game six of the NBA Finals tonight. Uh, one of the great phrases in all of sports, Chris. I know game seven gets the shine, but game six is what they rap about. This is the stuff of legends. It's, I feel like I can get in a time machine and go back to my childhood. What are your earliest memories of the NBA Finals, of covering the Finals, and how have you seen your role change uh, since those early final memories? Uh, I mean, you're, you're certainly doing more work. I mean, <laughs> early finals, I was more of a fact checker at SI and a reporter gathering quotes for people like Jack McCallum and Ian Thompson and all the other great writers that came through SI in the early two thousands. Um, you know, the first one I really started to write about on a high level was the Boston 08 finals when they won the championship. And I remember that game six, you know, being a coronation really. I mean, that's kind of, I have something of a similar feeling tonight. I mean, the Celtics, they just smacked around the Lakers in game six of that series. I don't think the Lakers, uh, I, I just think they had given up or they got, they got jumped on early and then gave up. Uh, I, I can almost see something similar happening in this Milwaukee series. I mean, the Bucks have just jumped on Phoenix for these last three games and, and beaten them. If Phoenix gets down early, the Bucks are a great home team. There's going to be such a rabid crowd there in Pfizer. Um, I, I can see this game being uncompetitive, non-competitive in the second half in the same way that game six of the 2008 finals was. Chris, as we wrap up here and as the NBA season wraps up, you know, I get a little sad. I get a little nostalgic for the season that just was. But now as basketball fans, we're blessed with social media. We can keep tabs on our favorite players as they go jumping off yachts around the world. <laughs> they go on vacation. They go to wineries. What's your NBA offseason looking like? Are you linking up with Magic Johnson on the boat with Sam Jackson? No, there'll be like the NBA offseason isn't very long. That's for sure. I mean, you you get to free agency on August 2nd. You go to Summer League on August 9th. Uh, that wraps probably third week, fourth week, third week in August. And then, you know, for me anyway, you're writing the NBA preview issue for the magazine that comes out in October at that point. So if I get if I get a week to just shut the phone off, I'll be I'll be a happy camper this offseason. Well, we'll be sure to check in with you then. As always, great stuff. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, yeah, enjoy the games tonight. Enjoy the Olympics, man. All right. Thanks. Chris Mannix joins the show, Sports Illustrated, the crossover podcast. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.